I want to believe. Chapter 10. The Accident. The long-predicted international revolutionary wave finally arrived in 1968. In dozens of countries, in every continent, and on both sides of the Iron Curtain, students and workers rose up to strike, riot, and occupy schools and factories in direct confrontation with the post-war order. The rebels' issues were various. Civil rights, solidarity with the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, the treatment of workers, state censorship of opposition, popular exhaustion with imperialist war, segregation, police violence, bureaucratic authoritarianism, or class society in general. The struggles rapidly swelled and combined on a global scale into a cohesively socialist movement that broke down old forms of struggle, all with a lack of clear direction and leadership. It should have been the Trotskyists' moment. Yet, when someone asked one of them what they were doing during those epical years, they might respond like Piero Leone, quote, I was on Mars. The Posadas were well situated to be washed away by the anti-authoritarian spirit of the, quote, new left. But this dynamic existed for nearly every other tendency as well. Trotskyism was largely revealed to be paralyzed by pugilistic splits, isolated within increasingly small sects, and ideologically centralized around orthodoxies seen as too conservative for many of the 68ers. Posadas responded to the most iconic peak of the wave, the May Youth Rebellion in France, by categorizing its student protagonists as petty bourgeois, at best allies to the working class, and disparaging them with the same vocabulary as the conservative press. Quote, they don't shave or bathe, they repel everyone. It's a bohemian phenomenon, a combination of the fashion of protesting against capitalism as a way of escaping capitalism. It indicates the influence of the proletariat, but with an individualistic sentiment. End quote. By June, however, Pulsatis admitted that the students were the new proletarian vanguard, after scenes of their courageous street fighting and behind-the-scenes coordination with industrial workers, inspired a wave of wildcat factory occupations. When major unions controlled by the French Communist Party called for a general strike on the 13th of May, the state finally caved, agreeing to reopen schools and free jailed protesters. The occupations and strikes continued anyway. Dozens of schools and factories were declared autonomous as workers and students united in demands that surpassed those of the organized left. The end to the de Gaulle regime, its imperialism, and the bourgeois order in general. Still, Pulsatis believed that without his program and the formation of Soviets, the movement would be left vulnerable to counterattacks from the state, the return to capitalist stability, peaceful coexistence, or, worst of all, calls for nuclear disarmament. He called on communist union leaders to stop any attempts to, quote, moderate the insurrection, and the Red Army to invade France if the rebellion turned to civil war, essentially hoping that Paris would be a domino, leading to the, quote, final settlement of accounts he still maintained would arrive by the end of the decade. With no major influence in either the unions or universities, the Posedist Parti Communiste Revolutionaire Trotskyites, only measurable contribution to the struggle was selling the doomsaying screeds in Lut Communiste, outside assemblies and at the sides of the marches that passed them by like history itself. The fatalism of war revolution may have eased the pain of watching thousands flock to the leadership of Alain Krivin of the rival Trotskyist Unified Secretariat of Fourth International, USEC, who announced his candidacy as the left opposition to de Gaulle and the Parti Communiste Francais, PCF, in the June snap elections. Despite his vast unpopularity, de Gaulle's party exploited fear of civil war to win the most seats. Gravine received roughly 1% of the vote. In a meeting of the International Secretariat, Posadas complained his French section had shown, quote, a very large weakness of indiscipline, of mistakes, of individualism, of fear, end quote. Italy, Belgium, and England had proven themselves stronger and more dynamic in the demonstrations, but none rose to the standards of Latin America. 
While it was true the BLA sections had more influence in Latin America's 68 uprisings in Argentina and Mexico City, it was only an echo of what they once were. Through the first half of the decade, Argentine POT industrial factions, such as the Fracción Trotskista de Mecánicos, progressed nearly autonomously to become the most insurrectionary anti-capitalist wing of the Peronist workers' movement in the country, distributing illegal industry-specific newspapers in every major factory. In 1963, Kaiser, the largest auto factory in the country, announced it would close. The Pulsatists countered a proposal for a sit-down strike, with the full occupation of the factory, the implementation of worker control, and expropriation of the auto industry without compensation. Such calls were too radical for a time when the majority of workers seeing the horizon of their struggle as the return of Perón, and most party militants were fired and barred from the industry. As the 60s progressed, however, worsening conditions brought workers to similar conclusions as their blacklisted former fellow workers. In 1965, a Fiat factory in Córdoba was occupied in response to periodic reductions of hours that made it difficult for some workers to sustain a living amidst skyrocketing inflation. In 1966, the anti-communist military dictator Juan Carlos Ongania suspended the right to strike froze wages, and raised the age of retirement. Left-wing union leaders and known communists were rounded up, socialist student groups were brutally repressed, and another wave of strikes in 1968 resulted in mass firings of Kaiser and Renault workers. The repression was met with still more strikes and the formation of popular assemblies stretching into 1969. That May, radical auto worker Maximo Mena was killed when police opened fire on a march. Streets were barricaded and government buildings and the offices of foreign corporations were set on fire by way of revenge. Cordoba became totally ungovernable as the unrest was spread throughout the Argentine interior. Having lost their confidence in Hungania, the Junta replaced him in 1970 with a successor promising to move the country back to democracy a chain of events that resulted in a left Peronist president, promises of greater, quote, work control, and eventually the long-sought return of Peron. Today, the scholars of the Argentine labor movement, Monica R. Gordillo and Carlos Mignon, consider the Poseda shop committees to have been important elements in that trajectory, a fact lost to the cultural memory of Argentines today who only remember the Pulsatists as a, quote, cult of revolutionary cockroaches, prepping to survive nuclear war with the help of their UFO comrades. Another iconic moment of 68 was the long strike and school occupations of Mexican students and their catastrophic finale. The movement was based at UNAM, where the PORT had a small cadre in the economics department, the Fraccion Estudantil, led by Francisco Colemanares, one of the few militants not swept into prison during the 1966 raids. In his memoir of that year, Paco Ignacio Taibo recalled them as the most fanatic among the, quote, four species of Trotskyists, quote, almost indistinguishable from votaries of the Virgen of Guadalupe, who went about laying down tasks of the proletariat before, during, and after the Third Thermonuclear War. That quote. Federal security memos of student activity quoted some of their rhetoric. Quote, a member of the PORT, who called himself Willie, indicated that the struggle can only be violent and organized in the way that succeeds in Vietnam. He said here in Mexico, we have only just started to do something similar. That is to say, the bourgeois only hear the words of the proletariat when they are accompanied by violent action. End quote. That summer, Poseidus updated Colmenares with a new line. Instead of moving towards armed struggle, the student movement should appeal to the civic nationalist sentiment of the working class by building a front with left-wing elements of the governing Partido Revolucionario Institucional, PRI. It was a hard ask. The PRI was deeply hated in its entirety by students for its violent repression and refusal to negotiate. 
Colmenares did his best, arguing that since the party's founder, Lazaro Cardenas, granted asylum to Trotsky, and nationalized major industries in the 30s, the party must still have populist and anti-imperialist elements that the students could help bring to power. Willie and his wife refused the new line and quit the group, organizing the Partido Comunista Revolucionario Trotskista, that became notable for publishing a newspaper encouraging textile workers to join the student movement. Colmenares, now a cadre of one, pressed on through the summer. According to Mexican historian Veronica Oicon Solanados, History of the P.O.R.T., quote, Los Profetas Armados, he actually earned an audience with the elderly Cardenas himself, and proposed the two become middlemen between the student movement and the government. The elderly general was said to have considered the offer, only to decline when asked a second time. In a fall semester assembly, Colmenares reiterated the need to work with the PRI, warning his fellow students that the government would soon divide the movement with violence. The vast majority disagreed and voted to continue the strike indefinitely. With the Olympic Games approaching and groups like Willie's making inroads with the working class as the students had in France, the state became desperate to end the unrest. On the 2nd of October, police opened fire on a student demonstration of 10,000 at the Plaza de las Tres Culturas. Unknown dozens were killed. Their bodies disappeared. Colmenares survived to watch the devastated student movement disintegrate in the aftermath of the massacre. The strike was called off at the end of the semester, and in the next, Colmenares continued to host assemblies with a fraction of the attendance. The dwindling numbers made him an easy target. He was arrested by the Federal Security Directorate in 1969 for, quote, invitation to rebellion, and affiliation with the Guerilla Posedes organization, with whom he was reunited in the end bloc of Lecumberi. Ironically, it was the events in Czechoslovakia, where the Posedists had no militants, that had the biggest effect on the international. In January of 1968, new president Alexander Dubček declared that socialism had been achieved in the country, and repressive state apparatuses remaining from the Stalinist era were no longer necessary. He promised a free press, implementation of a mixed economy, a wider variety of consumer goods, and movement towards a multi-party system. For the Soviets, the popular reforms were a threat to the integrity of their Eastern Bloc, and by the end of August, thousands of their tanks rolled into Prague. With little resistance, Dubček was deposed and his reforms reversed. The image of military might mobilized against a nominally socialist country heightened disillusionment towards the Soviet system among young leftists. Some Trotskyists, especially Ernest Mandel and the USSWP, enthusiastically hoped the Prague Spring and events of 1968 in general signaled an anti-bureaucratic reorientation of Soviet society back to truly socialist principles. Others echoed the opinion of Fidel Castro that, quote, the Czechoslovak regime was developing dangerously towards capitalism, and it was inexorably marching towards imperialism, end quote. Between these two extremes, Pulsatis judged the crisis as primarily interbureaucratic, the result of the, quote, putrefication of the bureaucracies of the worker states, end quote. He supported Soviet Premier Brezhnev's invasion, nonetheless, believing Dubček was inclined towards conciliation with the West that would weaken the position of the worker states. Elements of the intellectual core, especially Angel Fanjul and Guillermo Almera, were frustrated by what they saw as Mandel's sudden softness towards liberalism and criticism of the validity of worker states. With Posadas spending most of his time at international headquarters in Montevideo, they covertly added a like-minded young member to the political bureau of the Argentine section in August, and swiftly passed a strongly worded declaration for the front page of Vos Proletaria, beginning of long quote. 
the events of Czechoslovakia reaffirm the analysis of the Fourth International, of which we are living the last phase of this stage of final adjustments of accounts with imperialism and capitalism. Our party supports and calls to support unconditionally the military methods, still bureaucratic, of the worker states in order to defend the attack of capitalism. End quote. The position barely diverged from Poseidus. Both supported the intervention, however only Poseidus specified that it should have been primarily political rather than military. Quote, the working class in Czechoslovakia surrounded the Soviet tanks in order to discuss with the soldiers, he explained. Quote, Many workers said, come on, discuss, and we will chase out those people who want to return to capitalism. End quote. What infuriated Poseidus far more than the language of the editorial was the clandestine maneuver that produced it. A challenge to his authority, scandalous as the counter-revolutionary Prague Spring itself. Calling the affair the Crisis of H&M, after Herediria and Manuel, the party names for Fanjul and Almera, Poseidus wrote a long and scathing open letter to them, published throughout the International's press. Beginning of long quote. You work like bandits with respect to the International, because you are robbing the International. You are robbing. It is the function of the bandit. It is necessary to eliminate the bandit. Eliminate bandits. Make a tribunal to judge these comrades for violation of the discipline, the centralism, the policies, and the objectives of the International. The International proposes to overthrow the bureaucracy of the worker states. They, H&M, support the bureaucracy. Their document supports it. We propose to overthrow it. End quote. He went on to express his fear of a new split in the International. Quote, when we were with Pablo, we discussed and fought to correct the International, showing that we were right. When we saw that he was not able to be corrected, we formed our International. You are beginning to form another International. You have functioning as a leadership which is a part. End quote. The one-sided debate simmered for months in internal documents and newspapers. Anyone unfamiliar with the Argentine section or international leadership would not have known to whom these initials referred, or exactly what they had done, but it served as a warning nonetheless against anyone thinking of challenging Poseidus. Almeida had his position stripped and was sent to organize a section in South Yemen. Fanjul, secretary of the party in Argentina, and the movement's lawyer, was expelled altogether. The punishments did little to soothe Posadis' paranoia towards his comrades, but soon proved costly as Uruguay, often thought of as South America's Switzerland for its permissive tranquility, began to move in the same authoritarian direction of its neighbors. The repression corresponded to Montevideo's own chapter of 1968 unrest. Economic stagnation led to labor strikes, student occupations, and increased popularity for the urban guerrilla Tupamaros. Worried that a peristyle insurrection could emerge, President Jorge Pacheco Areco declared a state of emergency that froze wages and authorized force against strikers in June. Medical student Liber Ars was shot and killed in subsequent riots, and more deaths and dozens of casualties followed when schools reopened in September. After the defeats in Central America and Brazil, Posetis hoped a change in strategy would keep him out of the crosshairs. Quote, We're going to infiltrate ourselves in the workers' movements and lead strikes, he announced. Affiliating with insurrectionary students and guerrillas would only mean more imprisoned comrades and martyrs, he wrote, and those movements were traps controlled by agents provocateur in an imperialist strategy to turn the native bourgeoisie against the left. The change of strategy came too late. On the 28th of October, Uruguayan police surrounded a BLA cadre school held on the outskirts of Montevideo in the coastal suburb of Shangri-La. There were at least 26 inside, including young militants from Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay, and the nucleus of the international itself, Poseres, 
his wife Sierra, and his secretary, Alberto Di Franco. Worried they would open fire, Poseres called for everyone to stay inside and destroy anything the police could use as evidence. As he began to burn a pile of reel-to-reel -reel tape, notes and documents, a canister of tear gas smashed through the window, the punishing fumes mixing with the smoke. One militant ran through a back door, attempting to distract the police, so others could slip away. He was immediately beaten, and the police continued to hold the line. Figure Excerpt from December 10, 1968 edition of Red Flag, a newspaper of the Revolutionary Workers' Party, Trotskyists, British section of the Poseidas 4th International courtesy of the Encyclopedia of Trotskyism Online. A Statement by Bertrand Russell In Defense of the 26 Trotskyists Beginning of Long Quote The arrest of 26 militant socialists in Uruguay on the 28th of October for the crime of attending a meeting was an outrageous act by the government. A judge soon decreed that none of those arrested had committed any crime and that all ought to be released. Nevertheless, they remained in detention. On November 2nd, the prisoners obtained an agreement that they could go into exile to a place of their own choosing, thereby saving those among them of Argentinian extraction from the deportation to Argentina, where their lives would be in danger. This agreement was not implemented promptly, and the prisoners remained the victims of vindictive Uruguayan government and police action. These prisoners have the right to live and work in their own countries. If, however, these countries are so dictatorial as to not permit such liberties, the prisoners must at least be released and permitted immediate asylum. End of the statement by Bertrand Russell After almost three hours, the comrades worried the police were searching for a reason to kill them, and finally surrendered. The men were brought to a military barracks the women detained in a nursing school. Under interrogations, they told a rehearsed story. They were on vacation. No one knew anything about the International or its leader. Quote, Two comrades of 12 and 14 years were asked, Is this Posadas? I don't know who that is. What's your name? I don't know. During the interrogations, their comrades loudly sang the International again and again to keep spirits high. Quote, all comrades centralized on one concern, defend Poseres. Poseres wrote in an internal document in which he referred to the raid as El Accidente. Quote, they couldn't try anyone, he continued, pleased with the confusion. He believed his pseudonym caused the Uruguayan police. Quote, because Poseres doesn't exist. End quote. In reality, Uruguayan officials knew Cristalli was Poseres. Latin American security agencies were aware of his support for the FLN, the Cuban Revolution, and MR-13. After the raid on the Mexican PORT, the DFS complained to Uruguayan officials that the armed group was being directed by someone operating out of Poseres' Montevideo address. The Poseres were also being watched for their connection to the living folk hero founder of the Tupamaros, Raúl Sendic brother of Poseres' longtime Lieutenant Alberto. They may have known little else about the International, but those links were enough to warrant his expulsion from the country. Picture Angel Fanjul at a March for Human Rights in France, 1978 Courtesy of Factor El Blog In their initial court appearance, a party communique said, The judge ordered all the prisoners released. The military intervened, invoking the state of emergency to keep the foreign nationals in custody. The state-appointed barrister offered Poseres an agreement to be deported to Argentina within 48 hours. He recalled accepting at first before the expelled Fanjul arrived from Buenos Aires to negotiate. Longer prison terms, or worse, could await him in Onganias, Argentina, Fanjul cautioned. When Poseres met the barrister again, he threw the document on the ground. Quote, we aren't going, he told him. He immediately, quote, turned pale. 
Uruguayan officials agreed to give Fanjul some time to find a safe country for exile. A week went by. The longer, the better, Poseidus thought. More time to build a solidarity campaign and sympathetic notoriety from the global movement to give them leverage. On the 2nd of November, Poseidus was able to smuggle out a message through a visitor. Quote, All the international must give itself the immediate task of organizing an intense campaign of defense and support to the struggle of the comrades in Uruguay, he wrote. Blaming the raids on an alliance of imperialists and counter-revolutionary Communist Party leaderships, quote, directed at eliminating, assassinating the 26 Trotskyist militants as part of a concrete alliance of peaceful coexistence, end quote. The Posadist press spread the word of the arrests and urgently appealed to leftist politicians to take him in, and for sympathizers to donate funds. Letters of support were sent by Uruguayan Vice President Alberto Abdala, Montevideo Archbishop M.G.R. Partelli, left-wing journal La Marcha, student groups, and Trotskyist-aligned unions throughout South America and Bertrand Russell. Guards treated the prisoners remarkably well, turning a blind eye to contraband toiletries, coffee, sugar, mate, chocolate, and notes smuggled between prisoners and visitors. Poseres also won a letter of support from 14 other political prisoners, six of them members of the Communist Party, by leading nightly sing-alongs of his political versions of the Gardel standards. Quote, I didn't expect to get a singing lesson, Poseres recalled a young communist exclaiming in appreciation. After two weeks, Fanjul arranged an asylum deal with Chile through President Eduardo Frey Montalvo and then Senator Salvador Allende. Posedes, Previtera, and Di Franco were taken to Santiago on an Air France flight. The moment they stepped foot in Chile after landing, they were surrounded by police. The U.S. Embassy had learned of the arrangement during the flight and ordered the deal cancelled. The Posedes believed. When the police explained they would be put on the next flight to Argentina, the trio sat on the tarmac, refusing to move. The drama caught the attention of the Air France crew. Quote, Look, we are political exiles, Posadis explained to them. Ah, communists? Quote, no, no, Trotskyists. Ah, Trotskyists, the crew member exclaimed. I have a very, very good friend who is a Trotskyist in France. End quote. The crew, radicalized by the uprising in Paris earlier that year, promised the police they would take them out of the country as soon as possible. Champagne bottles popped. The pilot agreed to bring them clandestinely to France and dropped them with a, quote, Trotskyist leader at the airport. But as they attempted to work out the details of the plan, reality set in. While the events of 68 made much of France sympathetic to revolution, it also made its government paranoid about an influx of outside agitators. A second barrier would be a necessary refueling stop in Brazil, another country where Poseidus may have been a wanted man. Without a better idea, they flew back to Montevideo and returned to the barracks. Negotiations continued, with the threat of deportation still looming. Each section of the international doubled their asylum requests to sympathetic politicians, implying that Poseidus' execution was imminent. Appeals to Switzerland and Yugoslavia were declined. Quote, they were very agreeable, Poseidus recalled, but they believed it would cause a conflict with the Soviets. British Labour Party Minister Paul Rose made an attempt that seemingly went nowhere. Piero Leone took a train to Stockholm to appeal for the Swedish Socialist Party's help. Once arrived, he called home and heard the good news. The Italian Communist Party, PCI, had intervened on their behalf. Cristalli, Previtera, and Di Franco were oriundi, Italians of foreign birth, technically citizens. They were going home. Although the Chilean prisoners remained locked up for weeks to come, and the Uruguayan party was officially banned and driven underground, Poseidus boarded his flight to Rome, considering the whole affair to have been a happy accident. It was an almost supernatural confirmation of his entryist reversion, heavy-handed public feuding, 
and insistence on infallibility. He escaped with his life, wife, and secretary to the city where he was first inspired to create the International, invited by the most important communist party in the West. Although it was taboo in Marxist thought, Pulsatis believed the raid was nothing short of fate. End section.